All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the this is Monday, the 25th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. Well, let's start with the scripture. That way people that don't watch very long will at least find out what's important. So, of course, they might turn out, tune out that much earlier. Um, Book of Revelation, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Um, this isn't the subject exactly, just one phrase out of this. But it's this phrase is mentioned four times uh, to in four of the letters to the seven churches. Now, these were seven actual churches uh, in the, that were uh, connected with John the Apostle during his exile yeah, at Patmos. They were basically within a, uh, like a hundred mile radius or less of the island of Patmos. And they would send messengers, angels, messengers, that's the word, angelos means messenger, to John, bringing provisions. Uh, they, he was not provided food and clothing by the authorities. He was put out there to die. Sooner the better, as far as they were concerned. Uh, so they would bring him food and clothing, what he needed, and they would also bring message, communication and bring communication back. To their churches. So these are not seven church ages. These are seven uh, churches that existed simultaneously, real churches. But their message is applicable to every church everywhere. But don't believe the nonsense. Or, oh, there's seven church ages. That somebody made that up. Well, it seems to fit. Well, yeah, you, you created a paradigm and then you fit the evidence into it. Uh, a narrative, as I say today, to the angel of the church, to the messenger of the church of Sardis, write. That's what the word means. Angels, supernatural angels, are divine messengers. Uh, messengers from God, spiritual messengers. These things, but you don't need to, John didn't need to write a letter to an angel. Why can't translators just use some common sense? These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, in a vision earlier in this uh, book. I know your works, that you have a name that is alive, but you are dead. Well, in the United States, evangelical. There's a name that's, that, that uh, says that you're alive, but you're actually dead today. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God, complete before God. Remember, therefore, uh, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not, will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Four times in the seven letters we see the phrase, hold fast. Hold fast. 
and you could look at all these letters and see uh, how there of, of the uh, seven, only two have no rebuke from Christ. The church of Smyrna, which was persecuted, and the church of Philadelphia, which Christ had no complaint about either. But the majority of them, yeah. Uh, a couple he has nothing good to say about at all. But this is not about the book of Revelation per se uh, in this particular text. So what I want to talk about is, in a sense, what the book of Revelation talks about, what also Christ talks about by the end times, and where we are today, and why we can't live in the past, and why we have to deal with what we have, why we have to hold fast. This is a time to hold fast to what's been delivered onto us. It's not a time to build. This is a time to hunker down. And some people, th you cannot, Jesus said in the last days, the love of the majority of Christians would grow cold. See, not unbelievers. Unbelievers have no love for God. Love for God is something God gives. But believers, the love of the majority, is, I believe, the best way to translate that right there. It says the many, literally, but that is usually an expression for more than half, will grow cold. Majority of Christians. Because of the, of the exploding, the multiplying of lawlessness, and certainly... I was thinking back, when back to about 2015, we, we began experiencing this utter explosion of lawlessness at all levels, starting with the Supreme Court. They're ruling on, uh, Obergefell ruling on gay marriage. Uh, how that there was a, a constitutional right to sodomy. Hmm. That was unique truly unique, lawlessly unique. The, the fact that uh, even the court recognized that this was contrary to 6,000 years of human civilization, but nevertheless, let us let, let that not hold us back. See, the, the utter casting off of restraints that we see prophesied in Psalm 2, where the nations cast off the, the cords, the restraints, the shackles of God. Say no, we're just going to do what we want. We don't care. Well, that's and that's also a prophecy. It, says, it talks right there in that psalm about that happening, and then the sun coming, the son of God, kiss the sun while you're yet in the way. In other words, make your peace with God, with Christ before. See what's happening. This is happening on uh, in the on the very verge of God's judgment. As Christ said, as the prophets say, as the Psalms say, as the apostles taught, in the last days there will be this explosion of lawlessness, this revelation of the man of sin, man the sinner, not an individual, but humanity, that the true nature of sinful humanity, would on restraint. You understand? That's what second what Paul's talking about in Second Thessalonians. He's talking about he's not talking about an individual that people call the Antichrist. The Bible nowhere says there will be one Antichrist anyway. Already in John's day, many had arisen. We have to think biblically about things and not allow the narratives of certain people from the past, like John Darby and Schofield, to control how we understand the scriptures. We have to understand the Bible in the Bible's own terms. 
The Bible has to be our restraint as Christians when we think about these things. When we think about God, when we think about humanity, we have to say, what does the Bible actually say about this? Not what some preacher said or some theologian said. Or... That's irrelevant. What does God say? Only what he says truly matters. So, uh, but the, the admonition so often is repeated uh, in the book of Revelation, especially to the churches, is to hold fast. Hold fast to that which was delivered to you, to the gospel. In the epistles, we find Gal the book of Galatians, which is all about them failing to hold fast to salvation through Christ alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. But instead, going back and apostatizing uh, to, to return to the law. There's no salvation in the law. Only in Christ. The law only shows your sinfulness. It can't save you from sin. It shows you your problem, not your solution. Although there was a promise of a Savior in the law, all the way back in Genesis, all the way back in the garden, there was the promise of the seed of the woman, the one who would crush the head of Satan, the Savior. Indeed, throughout the Old Testament, we find scatterings of that promise of the one who is to come, the one who will actually save us from our sin. Not just the consequences of sin, but from the bondage of sin. So, uh, let me take that down. Yesterday at church, the, on contrary to his normal practice, the preacher didn't actually preach out of the scripture. He preached out of mythology. They're going to have a revival next week. So he was preaching the myths of revivals, like the Welsh Revival and Jonathan Edwards. Let me say so-called revivals. I don't believe in revivalism. I don't see it taught in, this, in the Scripture, especially in the New Testament. And indeed, the, the pastor's text was from, uh, from uh, uh, Psalm 85, where it mentions one time in there, contrary to the context, I mean, it's not contrary to the, that context, but the, the pastor was using this out of context. Revive us again, O Lord. Well, having a special speaker come in for four days ain't going to do it. What does Jesus say? Repent and hold fast. I did mention to the, the pastor there about the, the song I complained about, the, the CCM, His Robe for, for Mine song by Christensen. Um, it has a lot of good things in it, but it's got a couple things in there that really are bad, especially the line in the chorus or the, the uh, f phrase in the chorus. God estranged from God. And I just wanted to mention that to the pastor and wondered if he'd noticed that. He said, well, yeah, I sort of... But obviously it was not a front, a front burner issue with him. Uh, I had the impression that, I, that he'd rather not talk about these things. <laughs> he had other things in his mind, okay? I'm, I'm not critiquing him particularly on that. He agreed with me, but that's not what was on his mind. I think what is on his mind is his congregation has shrunk by 50%. And now they no longer have an associate pastor. And when he left, a large part of the youth left with him. Uh, it's not a small church, uh, it's, but it's, uh, there's, I don't know what the attendance is, well over 100, I think, still. But it used to be packed. It used to be packed. I'd say it's a, a medium-sized church by most standards, probably seats at least 300 people in the building. And 10 years ago, it used to be packed. Sunday mornings, 
you needed an usher. If you were a guest and you didn't show up early, you needed an usher to find a place to sit. And like most churches, if you're a guest, you probably shouldn't come early because if you do, you'll sit in somebody else's spot. Not polite, but, you know. They won't really mind if it's a good church, but it's st still, it's, it's like, that's our spot. <laughs> they won't say that, they'll be too polite. But still, you know, if you love the brother and you don't want to do things like that to him necessarily. Anyway, uh, so you find a spot that's not currently occupied by anybody on a regular basis and make your spot there. Preferably in the back someplace. Uh, although the front pews are generally always empty and available. Why is it nobody wants to sit there? I know why. Anyway, the, the, the sermon was about revivalism. He was prepping us for the coming revival. Well, you can't make a revival anyway. Well, it was true. I mean, he was talking about prayer and that you can't just manufacture it. It wasn't bad. Uh, he was bringing up tales of past revivals, but I think most of those things are probably actually tales, not really. He said I, he's read this and he's read that, and well, so what? It wasn't in the Bible. And if you believe what's written in Christian books, you're foolish. It's a good thing I don't have a Christian bookstore anymore. And a lot of them, like uh, Benny Hinn, he was just nothing but a pack of lies. All his reported miracles, all lies. All lies. He probably believed them himself, but that doesn't mean anything. Some people seem to be able to believe lies without any problem at all. Uh, just ask them for proof, though, and you find out, well, all his miracles just evaporate. Or they're completely psychosomatic things that you know, that, that the uh, uh, Christian science or anything else, hypnosis or something like that, could get about as far. And they usually fade away with time. Now, your, your mind is able to do a lot of things, including suppress pain. But that doesn't mean it can actually solve the problem. And our bodies are strongly influenced by our, our mental state. Uh, you can make yourself sick. But that is not a miracle from God. I've heard all kinds of things claimed to be miracles or revival, and they weren't. They weren't. It usually comes out when the person's testifying and they're claiming this and that, or it, sometimes it's manifestly obvious where, where uh, I remember one preacher, Pentecostal, Mexican preacher, oneness Pentecostal, yeah, jeepers. See, there's no discernment among Christians that, that we're bringing in these people that were, they didn't care about doctrine. It's all about experience, about feeling, about emotion, which is dangerous. That's why the Pentecostal and especially the charismatic movement are, because the charismatic movement doesn't have a history of sound doctrine. See, at least the Pentecostals were rooted in evangelicalism. Uh, <clears throat> generally. Of course, they the oneness Pentecostals, there was an immediate split almost after Azusa Street, and some of them just cut themselves off from sound doctrine and went off in their own thing. That's where the oneness came from, the, the non-Trinitarian. Just stay away from them. Uh, Assemblies of God doctrinally is not, you know, they're, they're about the most stable. I don't want to condemn them completely, but they, they will give too much heed to uh, so-called revelations. They tend to be conservative on that, but still. You know, the, the myth, the, the, the great myth of a, a great end times revival, it doesn't come from Scripture. The Scripture says an end times apostasy. But that's the, the problem with all these groups. If anybody talks about this great end times revival, you know that they are not, they don't take the Bible serious. They have other sources they rather listen to. And that's what it usually is. People would rather listen to something that is pleasing to them than what God says, especially with what when God says something that's not comfortable. So anyway, this coming revival, and I was thinking, and there were there was a you know, music was selected for this, and 
revive us again. It wasn't about necessarily bringing new members in. It was about uh, the church getting revived. Which tells me something about concerns there. And that's a good thing. Uh, bringing new members into a dead church is not a <laughs> thing to do anyway. Uh, I, I don't have any serious problems with it, with the church there. But the idea that going back, and so well, back in history, supposedly these things happened. He mentioned the Second Great Awakening, which was completely bogus as far as I'm concerned. I don't think the First Great Awakening, I think it's really been hyped. All these things have been way overhyped. They never had as much effect as is claimed for them, including the Welsh Revival. Oh, they, you didn't even need the, 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 the police department shut down because they weren't necessary anymore. Prove it. Prove it from actual history. Some people go back and they actually research the, the, the his, history. They don't find it. It, it, it doesn't, it, it, all the things have been so exaggerated that they, they're not believable. Be skeptical, except on the scripture. Be skeptical of your understanding of scripture, though. What people tell you about the scripture may not be the truth. So, as far as this revival, uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm not, it's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen because it's contrary to scripture. The scripture talks about a great end times apostasy among believers. That the majority of believers, their love will grow cold because of the explosion of lawlessness. And since, especially in the United States, and the United States has, you know, the Europeans were doing this already. And the Supreme Court decides to use the Europeans as their source of authority, of course. Uh, the the uh, Obergefell decision uh, legalizing uh, homosexual marriage or whatever else. There were some justices had concerns. Well, how are we going to stop some of the other problems that are even worse? Uh, what's the basis for law at all? Well, that the scripture prophesies this very thing. The nations cast off God's restraints. Let us cast his cords from us, their cords from us. Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 2, not chapter, Psalm 2, the book of Psalms. This was sung in the temple. Uh, the very th That's prophesied, and the, and the coming of Christ is prophesied in that very Psalm 2. T-O-O, -T -T -O -O, too, also. Uh, and throughout the scripture, we see this message, and we see it uh, sh uh, pre-shadowed in the book of, uh, of Exodus, where Moses goes up on the mountain, and he is, is delayed there, and the people think, uh, well, what's happened to this guy? He's obviously dead. See, nobody could live up there for these many for forty days without food and without water, and he's dead. So what are we going to do now? And they went back to what they knew in Egypt, re, uh, returned, apostatized, and got Aaron, the squishy high priest, to make them a god of gold, a golden calf. And Aaron said, this is your God, O Israel. He said, this is Yahweh. Worship, worship the calf. The calf will lead us. Now, they had these daily miracles from God, which continued to take place. The daily manna, the miraculous water, continued all through this time that Moses was on the mountain. But because Moses delayed his return, you see the uh, parallel. Christ's return is delayed from our point of view. There's a reason for that, because the gospel must first be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end shall come. Well, with the Internet, it's available everywhere. Even in places like China, you can read the scriptures on the internet, even if they can't. You can't buy a Bible. You can still read it on the internet, and people 
because of travel and everything else, it has become known. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, known to every individual, but to the nations of the world. It's been preached as a witness. It doesn't have to be accepted, but a witness. They've heard it. It doesn't have to be perfect either. They've heard it. Jesus Christ died for our sins, and through him there's salvation. Even corrupted Christianity like Roman Catholicism still can bear that much of a witness. The problem is, how does it apply to you individually? Is uh, does the church necessary? That's where it's been the corruptions come in. Not the basic fact. Not the basic theology. No, it's the additional necessity of being in communion with the Pope. Uh, no, that's uh, where the problem comes. And, you know, and things like that. They've, uh, that if you trust in the church rather than trust in Christ, you won't be saved. Because that's not where salvation is. It's not in a human organization. Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not in a human organization. It's in Christ himself. But they don't have to understand that. They don't have to understand the details. Just the witness is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came, died on the cross for our sins, and through faith in him, you could be saved. That's the message. God has made salvation available to all. Free. No charge. Grace. That's what grace is. Not at our expense, at his expense. The expense of Christ, who had to die on the cross, that we might not have to. So that has gone out into all the world, and now we see this, this apocalypse of evil, this apocalypse of lawlessness that uh, seemed to arise after 2015, in the, in the last, uh, the end of uh, Obama's second term, uh, with this explosion of lawlessness, uh, so the presidency, the courts, uh, all the way down. Lawlessness has always been present, but this is this explosion of it. And uh, in the Western world in particular, uh, this, the, uh, the new morality, shall we say, the new Antichrist morality that is uh, throwing off the restraints of God completely in every area, uh, including... Uh, physical creation, natural gender. It's discarded. It means nothing. Utter lawlessness, disregarding uh, reality itself. They cannot accept verse 1 of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They just won't do it. Another manifestation, the lawlessness of science. It's everywhere. This explosion of lawlessness. Again, it's always been present, but the mystery of iniquity has always been present, but now it's exploding. And it's a revelation. See, the, 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 it, the, the, the mystery of iniquity has become the apocalypse of iniquity. The, the, the apocalypse means the unveiling or the revelation of, just like the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ as in, his, in reality, in his presence and his, uh, his glory. Uh, not not concealed in a, a, a infant in Bethlehem, but in his uh, uh, his divine uh, the God Man in his in his fullness, unveiled. Uh, who is coming again? But before the revelation of Christ becomes a revelation of this lawlessness, this. And this makes sense because Christ is coming in judgment. So you have uh, God is removing the restraints. His, the, rest, or the, God, the restraint has been removed. We see that in Psalm 2 and other places, uh, casting off the restraints of God, the, God's commandments, other things, uh, in order that God, God, is, God is presenting his case. See, this is the, the evidence that is presented before the judgment seat. So what's happening is just like Moses was going to come down from the mountain with God's law, and immediately before that, God's people cast off restraints and run amok 
and engaged in all kinds of uh, carnal behavior, including idolatry, which is, an, uh, which is a, the, the greatest abomination in God's sight, to substitute something like a golden calf and call it Yahweh. That is, that is a complete, uh, just talk about punk, poking your finger in God's eye deliberately. That's it's about as bad as you can get. And it's the same thing happening today. We see that, so that, that right before Moses was about to come, what happened? Moses appears. God tells uh, Moses, your people are having a party. Get down now. Get down, Moses. Go down, Moses. <sighs> you, you've got to restrain them. So Moses comes down and uh, God's judgment falls. God's judgment falls on the people. On the Mo Moses said, he that is with the Lord, let him come to me. And everybody else, boom, kabam. Uh, and that's, these are shadows of the end times where it is those who come to Christ are the only ones that will truly be saved. There are people that are that enter into the millennium because of uh, how they treated God's people. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in jail, and you visited me. That's referring to uh, people that aren't necessarily Christians, but treated God's people uh, that way displaying a, a compassion and a, a care for them. And because of that, they're allowed into God's kingdom. Living people, physical people, they're allowed to enter in. And the rest who didn't, who mistreated God's people, well, they're not allowed in. So we have this, this very thing that parallels Moses coming with the law, Christ is coming in judgment. And before that, the world is going into this crazy party. They're throwing off restraints, engaging in idolatry and all kinds of abominations. That's what's going on today. So when, when I was thinking yesterday in in church about the revival, I was thinking, this ain't going to work. It's not going to work. I mean, there, I, th I think there's a probably desperation among the church leadership because their, their attendance has been cut in half. You know, they still got a building to maintain, money, need it. Obviously, their, their staff has been reduced now. I don't know why the, 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 the assistant pastor left, although typically... An assistant pastor is somebody that stays for not too long at a church and then goes on to pastor a church as a senior pastor, which is the way things should be. Actually, pastors should come up from the local congregation, but, you know, uh, somebody gets some experience someplace and they get some practice preaching occasionally and, and uh, then they go on to a greater responsibility after they've demonstrated that they can handle it. It's a good way to do things. Not bad. Uh, cons within the current practices. But, uh, so, I, I don't know. I imagine that supporting another full-time pastor you know, was beginning to have a little financial difficulty there. I had a large family. Large part of the youth in the church was the pastor's family. I don't know. I probably had seven or eight kids. Uh, so that's a loss right there. A whole pew is empty now. But uh, uh, but yet it was a good thing for him to go to some. There's so many places that ha don't have a good pastor. And the fundamentalist Baptists, you know, they're, they're, there's a good, the bad, and the ugly, and there, there need to be more good pastors in that movement. That's it, not even a movement anymore. All these movements have now, there's no longer a movement there because of the times we live in. Uh, it's not a time for revival. It's a time to hold fast. We have to hunker down and hold 
to that which been, has been delivered to us in the scriptures, in the New Testament. Hold to Christ. And don't expect some great end-time revival, because that's a, not, not what the Bible tells us. It's a great apostasy. To, to hold fast to Christ, to be careful not to be entangled with this world, to remember the warnings of the Scripture. Because this explosion of lawlessness immediately precedes the return of Christ. There's never been a time in this world like this time. And I suppose you could say that about every time, but the signs of the end are on us. Don't listen to the to the Bible prophecy teachers that have this scheme called dispensationalism. Not that all of dispensationalism is wrong, but they got it all laid out and charted out and chronologically computed and everything else. No, go by the major things, because the Bible does not teach their scheme. I don't want you to be deceived, and because Oh, the church is supposed to be raptured before any of this appears. Well, the man of sin, in the sense of the sinfulness of humanity, being unveiled, is happening before our eyes, and they're looking for an individual that they call the Antichrist. That's a deception, brothers and sisters. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the issue. It's like identifying all of Roman Catholicism with the Pope. Well, the Pope is an Antichrist because he opposes Christ and opposes the gospel. He substitutes himself for it. A vicar of Christ means a substitute for Christ. He's not. There's nothing Christian about that man. He is the most pagan of all popes. Openly, idolatrous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when was that? Oh, that was right. That was the month before COVID became the first public case of COVID. Uh, yeah, October of 2019. Bringing his Pachamama idols into St. Peter's. Parading them before, parading them right before the high altar. See, in Catholic theology, too, the, the, the bread... The consecrated bread and the wine that they put the fact they put the bread in the monstrance, the thing that looks like a sun with a little window in it, uh, and they worship that literally as as Christ. The, their, their theology is not only the body of Christ, it is his body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's a living Christ, which is going way beyond scripture. Scripture doesn't say anything of this kind at all. It doesn't say it's actually the, Jesus didn't say the the bread of the Passover was actually his body. Is means represents too. You have to go within the uh, a rational. You don't go into weird uh, metaphysical transubstantiation ideas when the the language permits a sensible understanding. You know, he's he was identifying himself with the Passover. He's saying the Passover is really about me. Not just about coming out of Egypt, it's coming out of the world into God's kingdom. So I am the Passover. This bread represents me. This, this wine represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant. See? But carnal human beings can't take the truth. They don't like the truth, so they invent their own ideas. Uh, but uh, anyway, how did I get on there? The this revelation of the apocalypse of the apocalypse of evil is the common end times sign and the apostasy of many believers or most believers i don't like most is to me most means like 90% but the, the majority of believers more than 50% would be the safest way to say that uh because I when when the 
the many would be a literal rendering of it, and that usually in Greek means the majority. These are the two real signs of the last days. The ones we, the things we can know for sure, other than how to interpret the the visions of John in, in the Book of Revelation, which are, you know, that's let's just say it's a little bit difficult right now. It's when it happens or after it happens, okay. Oh yeah, now I see. But prophetic visions. I mean, you have to understand the Old Testament and everything else. But you take the basic message that's being communicated there and try, try. It's like the parables. I think if we look at the book of Revelation and look at the visions, now the whole sequence of visions is not just one linear thing. So if we look at what they're saying on the large scale, instead of trying to sort out all the details, like a parable, you look for the basic message that's being communicated there not ask all kinds of questions about the, the details in the parable. That's not the purpose of a parable. It's not the purpose of a vision either, to give us all kinds of little details. No, it's it's the big picture is what it's being presented there, and that's what we should look at. And understand that this is in spiritual language, and you know it's not about a literal dragon. Uh, and coming out of the sea and and associating that with China, for example, because the or or the Russia and the bear, you know that those kind of associations are reading modern ideas back into the scripture. That's called eisegesis. That's not something you want to do. So we need to, uh, and that's what so many of these prophecy writers have always done, because they make their money out of scaring people. Uh, and also telling people what they want to hear. It's sort of like horror movies, you know, the, the desire to be frightened, they're, they're, to, to get that adrenaline rush or whatever it is. That's, that's a weirdness in fallen humanity too, I think. Uh, but the, the whole world is against Christ, as it always has been, but now is it's this explosion of lawlessness everywhere. From from the highest levels of government to the to the street corners, uh, all of of course all of the entertainment industry, uh, which includes sports and music and everything else, is all godless. America is the most godless of nations. Uh, it doesn't matter it has most churches or anything else; it's still godless. The the structures, the whole system is godless. It's always been godless, but now we have this explosion of unrestrained wickedness, unrestrained godlessness. Just throw off all the restraints of God. And and this is new. This is new, especially in the last decade. The mystery of iniquity has always been here, as Paul says, but now we have this, this just, the restraint is gone. There's nothing holding these people back from doing these absolutely crazy things. They're rejoicing. As the, uh, the, I remember the parades after the Obergefell decision. Uh, the, 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 the parades, people rejoicing in the streets over this decision, uh, publicly displaying their sin. And they continue to do that. Just a couple blocks from me, there's a, a couple of older women that always have a gay flag uh, prominently displayed on their front porch and gay signs in their yard uh, promoting not only that but also promoting a local the largest local Methodist church United Methodist Church one side it promotes that and the other side it says learning to love like Jesus well I think I know where that Methodist church is theologically United Methodist Church. Cast off all restraints. See, the, the current split that's going on in the Methodists is because of that. Those who say, no, we have to maintain the, the, the scriptures and maintain even their own church law. Now they said, no, cast it off. 
cast off all these restraints. That's what's going on. That's a sign of the times. This is not a time to expect revival. You're not going to have revival in a time the Bible uh, tells us is going to be a time of apostasy. It is a time to hold fast. It is a time to repent of flirting with the world. It is a time to, to reinforce, uh, remind ourselves of sound doctrine, sound teaching, the sound gospel. The gospel hasn't been annulled. We have to make sure that that is the message, that that is our witness to this world, the love of God in Christ, salvation from sin. Not just covering over your sin, but salvation from the bondage to sin. If you want to revel in your sin, go ahead. God hasn't given, taken, he hasn't, he's not restraining you. But realize you're going to judgment and you're doing this in the very sight of the judge. That there will, there will be no question when Christ comes and sets upon his judgment throne about what you've done. You're, you have not even restrained yourself. You've just given yourself over to it. Knowing that God does not approve of it. Well, I've never had the Bible. Well, you've got creation. That's enough to condemn you right there. The revelation in God's creation. Oh, I don't believe God created anything. See? It proves it right there. God says, yup, you know. You know he exists. He's made it evident to you. You're without excuse. You can make up all your lies, but they will not sway the judge. Because he knows better. And that's what's happening. It's the it's Israel partying while Moses is on the mountain getting the law. And Moses is coming down. That uh, the New Testament, that's just a, a, a type of the return of Christ. And Christ is coming down to judge the world. He came to save the world. The gospel's gone out into all the world. And now the time to judge has come. That's where we are. So if you think you're going to have a revival in a church and there's going to be people coming in and yada, 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 don't. No, it's a time to hunker down and make sure everything is solid. Check the structures of the building. Is it going to stand? It's like a hurricane's coming. Batten down the hatches, board up the windows, make sure that things that are easily broken are not going to be exposed to the storm. Lash everything down. That's the time we live in. A time to shut the doors and hunker down and let the storm pass by. It also brings up another parallel in the Old Testament. This parallel to the Last Supper, the Passover. Come into your houses, mark the door with the blood of the Lamb. Shut the door, and the judgment of God will pass over your house and those within it. But those are with, who are outside the blood of the Lamb. Death struck. The death of the firstborn. It's all these parallels between the Old Testament and New. But that's the time we live in. Was it an easy time for Israel? In bondage in Egypt? Uh, when Moses came, did, it make it, did they make their burdens lighter? No, it made it worse. Pharaoh got angry. Oh, now, now you can uh, not only have to make bricks, now you have to glean the fields for straw to make the bricks too. I'll just double your labors. The time of tribulation. We are in tribulation, brothers and sisters. Can't you discern the signs of the times? 
Are you so hardened by this world? Or have your eyes been so blinded by the things of this world that you, you cannot see what's going on? It's time to make sure that the blood of the Lamb is upon our house, that we are in Christ and hold firmly to him. That is the only place of safety. Prepping won't save you. Holding to Christ does save you. And don't put your trust in something. Well, I was saved back in 1943. Or whenever. 1976. Therefore, I don't have anything to worry about. Well, if you're walking in rebellion against the Christ, you should wonder whether you were actually saved at all. Do you still hold to him? I mean, we live in this world, so there's always the, the, the temptation to get entangled excessively. We should be disentangling ourselves. Not striving after the things of the world, especially in this time. But focusing more on Christ getting things ready for the storm, getting our lives ready, our, our, our focus, getting more tightly bound to Christ and less bound to the world. This is not a time for making plans for future careers because there's going to be a major reset and it's going to be God's reset not these globalists. God is going to reset things when Christ returns. Make sure that you make your peace with the judge before he takes his seat. Then it's too late. 